If you've made it through the other five videos, well, I'm impressed. I hope they've been helpful to you. This is the sixth and last of the videos about why the UMC is separating. As I've said when we began, I am a Methodist. That means I believe in being connected. Christians and congregations who decide to go it alone, that may seem like a good idea, but I don't see how it's wise. We all need to be connected and we all need to be accountable. I get it. Your bishop and your annual conference may not have been fair to you. You've been hurt and you don't want to put yourself in a place where you can be mistreated again. But I think there's an option for you that gives your church the best of both worlds. It provides your congregation with great autonomy and with all the benefits of being connected. It's called the Global Methodist Church. I've had the privilege of being a part of its genesis, and I'm excited about it. I sometimes refer to the GMC as the United Artist of the Methodist world. United Artist was a movie studio that was created in 1919 by a few actors, Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and Mary Pickering, and one director, D.W. Griffith. These four artists wanted more control over their work. They were tired of studio executives telling them what movies they could make and how much they could spend. They wanted creative control over their work, so they began a studio that was artist-friendly. And that's what the GMC is. It has been created by pastors and laypersons who know that the real work of the gospel does not happen through boards and agencies, but on the ground in the local church. The GMC has been constructed by persons who are local church-centric and who believe that you know what God is calling your church to do, who trust you, and who trust you to use your resources to do God's work. It has not been created by church bureaucrats who believe that you exist for them and their plans. I understand that some of you may worry what will happen a generation from now to the GMC, and you wonder whether it will still be a good fit for your congregation. I get that. But there is another concern. What will happen to your local church a generation from now after you're gone? Things can go off the rails either way. But I believe it's less likely that an orthodox denomination that can hire and fire their bishops, that has no trust clause, so you can leave any time, that does not allow bishops to force a pastor on you, I believe it's less likely that a denomination like that will soon go rogue. I think it's more likely that individual congregations will drift from the mission that they began with. So if you decide that you are Wesleyan enough to be connected to other churches, where do you go? Where do you land? Well, there may be many good options, and I know that I'm biased, but I am excited about the Global Methodist Church. I know the leaders. I know their hearts. I know their lives. I know their ministries. Their primary concern is not anyone's sexuality, but everyone's salvation. Their obsession is not with everybody lining up in lockstep, but with all of us moving out to be in mission. The goal is not to protect or promote our churches, but to plant new churches in places that haven't seen an Orthodox Wesleyan Church in decades, churches that combine grace and truth, churches that proclaim the gospel with clarity and live it out with compassion. Let me tell you two stories. I once spoke to a group of evangelical delegates in the southern part of Texas, what's today the Rio, Texas Conference, and I talked about the deep issues that are dividing us and why we must remain biblical. A progressive pastor in Austin came and told me that he took issue with what I'd said and that we needed to change our message or we would no longer be relevant to young people and that we would lose the culture. I thanked him for his comments and I reiterated why I believe that we had to hold to the classic Christian faith. He followed up with an email making the same points, not quite as politely as he'd made in person. And I wrote back to him and I said, let me tell you a story. I said, we had a young man on our staff. He worked with our youth for a number of years, did a great job. He worked with us as a minister of evangelism for one year. He wasn't ordained, and we knew he wouldn't stay with us for a long time. He was really a Southern Baptist. He'd grown up Southern Baptist. He'd grown up in a tiny little East Texas town. He was a Texas A&M Aggie. As a matter of fact, he was part of the Ross Volunteers, which means you are as Aggies as Aggies can get. And he felt called to start a church. We knew he could never start a United Methodist Church. 
but still he felt called to start a church. And do you know where he felt called to start a church? Austin, Texas. Now, if you don't know, Austin is probably our most progressive city in Texas, and the University of Texas is one of our more liberal universities. I told this pastor, I said, he felt called, this Aggie felt called, to start a new church for students at the University of Texas in Austin. And here we are five years later, and this guy that was too conservative for the United Methodist Church now has a church with 5,000 people coming every weekend. Some days I try to be a good person, so I didn't write this part, but I was tempted to. And brother, I looked up your church in your conference journal, and you are right across the street from the University of Texas. You have been there for 10 years, and you don't have 5,000 coming. You don't have 500 coming. You have 289 people on an average Sunday coming to hear your progressive message that's supposed to reach young people. Uh, another story, we had another young man on our staff. He found Christ in our church as a youth, went through our youth ministry, went to college, worked with FCA. He came back. He began to work with our youth. We put him in a position there. And then when we had an opening at one of our contemporary services, we thought he might be the person to take over. We interviewed him, and we discovered he was not where we were theologically. He was reformed. He was a real Calvinist. He was a follower of John Piper. Many people love John Piper, but he's a hardcore Calvinist and very different from we Westlands. He didn't believe women should be ordained, so we knew he'd never work for us. Loved him, still do, but he was just not going to be a good fit for us. Well, that was all right because he and his wife also felt called to start a church. And so they went back to where she was from. And in three years, that church had grown so much that they required three services. And where did they start these two, these two conservatives, two conservative for the Methodist Church? Where did they start their church that grew to three services in three years? Seattle, Washington, one of our most progressive cities. Friends, you've been told by our culture and sadly by many in the church that we must change our message to be relevant and to reach contemporary people. Christ crucified creates the picture of an angry God with a lust for blood. We must change our gospel. Christ as Lord is narrow and exclusive. We must change our preaching. Believing the Bible is the inspired and authoritative Word of God makes us antiquated and ignorant. It denies our lived-out experiences and the insights of human reason. We must change where we look for truth. A traditional understanding of sexuality makes us unenlightened and irrelevant. Stating that transformation is possible makes us hateful and harmful. We must change our morality. I've heard it. You've heard it. Now I hope you'll hear this. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel still works. God's power is still real. People are still hungry for something that progressivism cannot provide. People are still sick with something that the culture cannot cure. And people are still longing for something that can only be found in Jesus Christ. God has not changed. People have not changed. The human heart has not changed. The solution has not changed. So our gospel must not change. Wherever it has been preached with clarity and compassion and wherever it has been lived out by those who have proclaimed it, the gospel has transformed lives and changed the world. That's what the Global Methodist Church is about. I know that because I know Keith Boyette, a church planter and pastor, before he became president of the Global Methodist Church. I know that because I know Carolyn Moore, a church planter who built her church around recovery ministries long before she became the chairperson for the WCA. I know Jay Hansen, church planter in South Georgia. I know that because I know Bishop Mike Lowry, who has been about Jesus and bringing lost people to him for longer than most of us have been alive. I know that because I know Leah Hitty Gregory, whose passion for Christ and his people is without parallel and who is now the new chairperson for the Transitional Council of the Global Methodist Church. I know Kimba Everest from the DRC and the cost he has paid to build the church in one of the most desperate places on earth. 
Jay, Bishop Lowry, Leah, Kimba, all of them are on the transitional leadership team for the New Global Methodist Church, along with many others from around the globe. I know these people, and I cannot wait to be in a church that they lead. Will the GMC be a perfect church? No, but it will be led by people who understand that the church is not an institution, but a mission. And if that's what you want to be a part of, then the GMC is for you. Now, the GMC is not for everyone. If you want a guaranteed appointment system that allows for mediocrity in the ministry, then the GMC is not for you. If you want to be done with all this gay stuff, then the Global Methodist Church is not for you because the Global Methodist Church will joyfully and lovingly be in ministry to people who experience all kinds of sexual brokenness. If you want to be in a nice little family church where everybody looks forward to getting together on Sundays and you play nice while the rest of the world that Jesus loves is going to hell, the GMC is not for you. If you want to be in a church that doesn't affirm women in ministry, if you want to be in a church that doesn't delight in our racial diversity, if you want to be in a church where everyone votes the same way, please go independent because the GMC is not for you. But if you want to be a part of something new that God is doing, if you want to recapture our Wesleyan heritage and our Wesleyan mission, if you want to be in a denomination where white folks in the U.S. will soon be outnumbered by our black brothers and sisters in Africa, if you want to be a part of something that looks like the kingdom of God and something that is glorious, I think the GMC just might be for you. When I spoke at the first gathering of the WCA, which gave birth to the GMC, there in Chicago, I began with these words. Let's be very clear why we are here. We are here to begin something that will outlive every one of us in this room. We are here to create something that will exist for generations to come and that will grow the kingdom of God and change the world long after all of us are forgotten. That was the vision, that is still the vision. It will be hard for some of us to get there, but you can be a part of this. I've worked for three decades for this day, and people that I admired, Bill Henson and Eddie Fox and Ed Robb the Elder and Ira Galloway, all gone now. They labored long and hard before I began, men that I loved, men that fought this battle when it was truly hard. And others like Maxie Dunham and John Ed Matheson and Pat Miller still with us, they began this work when they were young, this work to create a church that is truly Wesleyan. A church that welcomes all, that is committed to Christ, that is founded on the scriptures, that's grateful to be a part of the historic Orthodox Christian faith, and a church that is unashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God into salvation. And the day is here when we can be that church. A church that will outlive us all and bless the world long after we are gone. That's what you're being invited into with the GMC. Something that is glorious. Something that is worth giving our lives to. Something that is worth sacrificing for. It may be hard to step into that. It may be costly. You and your church may have to make some sacrifices, but that's okay. Because you were made to take up a cross and follow Jesus and do hard things so that the world might know his grace. All I've ever wanted to do is be who God made me to be, do what God has called me to do, and do it with others who dare to believe that we are here to do great and glorious things for our great and glorious Savior. And my hope and prayer is that I will be able to do all of this with every one of you. God bless you.